supporting Monticello Christian Church family. Welcome to our online worship service. We're glad you joined us this morning. We want to say first a huge thank you to everybody who assisted with our Vacation Bible School this past week. It was a success because of your efforts and your hard work, all your prayers and all your support. So thanks go out to you, to everybody who helped us reach our church community and our local community with the fact that Jesus does the impossible. And so to God be glory for that. Let's begin our time together with a word of prayer. O oh God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporary, that we not lose the things that are eternal. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. another in prayer as well as ourselves as we go before the Lord this morning. Gracious God, in our selfish desires, we have forsaken fellowship with our families, friends, and neighbors. We have neglected our relationship with you, choosing worldly pleasures and desires over truth, justice, and righteousness. In a world of plenty, we've hoarded our earthly blessings rather than storing up heavenly treasures. Free us from such bondage that we may truly reveal the presence of Christ in our life. This day, we focus our prayers First upon those who are on our church prayer list and those who we bear in our hearts that we know that need your touch and need your healing in their life. We also lift up ourselves, Lord, that we lay our burdens before you and lift rightful praise to you in the silence of our hearts. Mighty God. Loving Lord, open our hearts this day as we proclaim your holy word, as we offer praise and thanksgiving, that in response to your abundant acts of love, we would be challenged to seek first your truth over the trappings and half-truths of the world. May what we experience this day call us to a rich relationship with you as we learn to live out the calling of our baptism through Jesus Christ our Lord. For it was he who taught us to pray this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>
Christ is our rock and firm foundation. When we as the church gather to worship, we set aside time to remember what Jesus did to demonstrate that love and to demonstrate that he is our rock of ages. Our worship of the Lord is seen through this act of eating bread and drinking from this cup. The rock of ages, Jesus Christ, is higher than Everest. He's more beautiful than Rushmore. He will outlast the Rockies. He is Christ our Lord, who, on the night before his betrayal, gathered with his disciples. And he took a loaf of bread, and after giving thanks to God for it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take this, all of you. This is my body, which is broken for you, and as often as you shall eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. He then took the cup, gave thanks to God for it, gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood which is shed for you, and as often as you shall drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. As we partake, may we remember that Christ's body was broken for us. May we focus on the blood that was shed for us, that we might have our sins washed away. Let us remember and rejoice that we stand upon the rock that never fails. God has greatly blessed this community of believers, and we demonstrate this as the body of Christ through our extravagant sharing of God's blessings for us. And we do so out of joy, not out of obligation, as we offer God the gifts of our hearts drawn from the labor of our hands and the generosity granted to us by our Maker. Let us ascribe to the Lord the honor due His name as we bring our offerings into His courts this day. Amen.
this week, our scripture passage comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, beginning in the first verse. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It remains in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I've loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I've made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. Love each other. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Our Sundays, as of late, have focused our minds and our hearts and our spirits on the disciple. Ourselves as a disciple. How to live as a disciple. What does it mean to be a disciple? We know that a disciple, as we've understood it, is one who knows and obeys Christ. How do we be a disciple? It takes a lifetime to live. To be a disciple, there needs to be patience. We need to trust and obey as a disciple should. A disciple seeks to make disciples. The question now is how? How do we go about making disciples? Many books and programs and studies have sought to answer that question. That we might jump on, as we might think of a fad diet, that we would jump on some kind of theorem or program or or, uh, uh, algorithm or something of the sort that would increase our effectiveness at being disciples that make disciples. I've literally wanted to write a book about this, discipleship. And I tell myself, well, when things settle down, I'll do, get around to doing that. I've been saying that to myself since 2017. Well, in the meantime, as we, as we seek to figure out how, it has to be something that is an everyday, while we're going. You see, last week we, we looked at the Great Commission. That's where we have to start is the Great Commission. And it's the everyday, while we're going through life, making disciples, where we find that key. And starting with the Great Commission, we see at the very heart that it is a commission, that the words of Jesus are a commissioning. A commission is a granted task or purpose. And the person or the authority that's giving the task to someone is first deeming them capable of achieving the task and giving them the authority to complete it. Jesus has all authority and all capacity within the world to go about completing and doing his will and purpose for this creation. Yet God commissioned us, gave us an opportunity to go out into the world while we're living this life that we've been given that is a gift to make disciples. Jesus empowered us. 
This week I was looking in a book by uh, Alan Briggs, and it's talking about the Great Commission. And it fleshes out more what the commission, this, this given task, looks like from the passage. We have been given authority first. We see all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That has been given now to us, that, that we have the authority. And Christ is saying that we have the capacity to complete this mission. We have a per new purpose. Go, therefore. That, that we are being sent with a purpose into the world. He continues, uh, make disciples of all nations. We're tasked with making disciples. That, that our commission is to go and make disciples. We're tasked with preparing the way for physical and spiritual baptism. That there is preparing the way in someone's mind, heart, and, and self to come to the baptism. Come to the place where they, before the gathered company commit themselves to being a member of the family of God while also the spiritual aspect of it because baptism merely isn't something that we do physically. It's not a rite of passage alone. It is something that is the change of our hearts and our worldview about who we are in Christ. We're tasked with sharing about Jesus, the Father and the Holy Spirit, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That, that there is a Trinitarian idea of having to focus on God that this isn't something that we do solely for ourselves. That this is, this is devoid of any connection to the to greater understanding of creation. That this focuses on our relationship with God. We're tasked with teaching others about the life and commands of Christ. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always, even at the end of the age. We aren't alone because the Spirit of God goes with us. That, that stuck out to me so much that, there's, that in this commission there's so much being told to us. So much that is, that is filling this commission given to us. As a church, this is our calling. And when I say church, as we've said, church isn't a building. That, that the people who meet in the building we call church is where the church building gets its name. The church isn't a building, yes. It's us. The Greek word for church, ekklesia, I had the congregation repeat it when I brought it up a couple of weeks ago. The literal definition, it, 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 the word refers to people, not a building. The literal definition of ecclesia in English is the called out ones. The ones who are called out. And, it, and it, it's pointing toward people. And, and we also know from Scripture, from the words of Jesus, that the workers are few, yet the harvest is plentiful. Workers are few to bring in the harvest. We may plant the seed in someone's life, but Christ is the one who calls forth the growth. And we, seeking to submit ourselves unto the Lord to be workers in the harvest, to be those who are tending to the fields, those who are disciples making disciples, our task is just that, to be disciples making disciples, to be the called out people, bringing in ourselves, family, and others. We are the called out ones who are called out to bring in ourselves, family, and others. First, it begins with the bringing in of ourselves. So we say, how do I, how, how do I make disciples? We bring it in. And it has to start, we think, our minds immediately go to, well, that other person. That, that making a disciple is going out into the world and finding a stranger and saying, hey, where, do you, where are you going to go when you die? We've got to start with ourselves. This is where we started in this entire conversation weeks ago. It begins with ourselves. We have to bring ourselves in. It starts with us in prayer with God and presence with each other and in the pew. You know, I like alliteration. Well, there you go. Prayer and presence and in the pew. We have to first get ourselves in the right place with God. We have to, we have to commit ourselves to seek, the, seek first the kingdom of God. We have to also not forsake the presence of others. There is the aspect of being in fellowship that, that goes into bringing... And it goes into the next step. But first, 
internally within ourselves we have to get ourselves loving God and loving others we ourselves have to seek to love others and we need to be in the pew we need to have which is to say we need to be in a position where the word is being spoken over us that we are taking it in that we are not forsaking the assembly many we can't many of us can't be there presently in person but you're here in this way now you're not forsaking the gathering and the learning and and the and the taking of a sabbath to focus our minds our hearts our wills toward god the workers in the field that are called out must first bring in ourselves once we have have sought that once we see as we did that we are we know and obey Christ we've brought ourselves in and are continuing to do so you see it has to begin with a personal holiness it has to be something that we live it's not merely something that we give mental assent to it's something that we live we that we're engaging in spiritual disciplines I can't help but notice in the word discipline a kinship to the word disciple that a disciple is, is disciplining themselves. And this, that's a word we don't like. We don't like discipline. I think it's the seven-year-old in us in time out and, and that we don't, we don't like the word discipline. But, but working out is discipline. And, and eating nutritious food is discipline. And going to work, to that there is discipline. Or going to school or, or visiting in-laws. There is, there is a, a discipline to that. That it is not something that we're eager to do or something that that is strictly enjoyable, that there is something that we, we're doing this that we might improve, that we might uh, uh, lay a, some of what we want down because this is something that we need. This is necessary and good. This, this deci word of disciple how, almost having a root in discipline. Spiritual disciplines of prayer and study and, and, and all, there's books and books and books and and blogs and blogs and blogs and, and, and passages and passages in the scripture of how we might seek first God. That's a, that's a message for another time, I'd say. We have to start with ourselves in order to next, you know, bring in family. Uh, family as in literal family that we ourselves individually, once we have come to the faith and knowledge of Jesus, once we're growing, then our natural response is to move to those who are closest to us, to our literal family, and seek to bring them to that same saving knowledge. Colossians 1, 28 and 29, bridging ourselves and bringing in, bringing in ourselves and bridging, bringing in family. He is the one we proclaim, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone fully mature in Christ. That we would discipline ourselves, that we would grow to maturity in Christ. Verse 29, to this end I strenuous, strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. That this is something that we would yearn to do for ourselves as well as with our family. As I said, literal family, those who are closest, but also supporting our church family, our fellow believers in our local area. That, that we would hold accountable and encourage and edify our our community, our church community, our families, those closest to us. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.6 You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. This idea of imitating Christ, imitating those who are discipling us. That when folks see us, they're not seeing us they're seeing christ in us that through our words through our actions being seasoned like salt with god there is a a tangible perceivable difference in us by the way that we encourage and edify and hold accountable those nearest to us so we bring in ourselves we get ourselves right we we seek to bring in those closest to us Next understanding, next echelon of making disciples is bringing in others, inviting friends and strangers to come and see. We, to, the, the scriptures give this incredible picture of, of 
seek first the kingdom, but, but taste and see that the Lord is good. That it not merely be something that we have to say, you're just going to have to take my word for it. That, that the burden of, of, of having to prove of our own understanding is taken off of us and say, just come and see. That, that within our lives, others can see because we are opening ourselves up. Even putting ourselves in a place of vulnerability that those around us would see that our walk and our talk match. But also that we would, that we would invite others to come and see the family of God, to engage with other believers or those who are not yet a part of the faith don't have a grasp or an understanding of who Jesus is and why we are setting our lives upon him, but to come and be in fellowship. The bringing in of ourselves and of our family and of others is how we might understand going and making disciples. Romans chapter 10, 13. For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. There's hope in that, isn't there? How then can they call on one they've not believed in? We can't call on the name of the Lord without believing. And if, if we don't believe in God, how can we call on God? How can they believe in the one whom they've not heard? They can't call on anyone they don't believe in. They can't believe on anybody if no one's told them about God. How can they hear without someone preaching to them? How can anyone preach unless they are sent? Perhaps we can see this in terms of commissioned. That Christ commissioned us. That all who call on the name of the Lord, that all who hold their lives before Christ as priority and number one, they are sent that they might preach and they preach that they might be heard and they are heard and in those that hear, might believe and those who believe would then call on the name of the Lord. That is a, a deconstructed, laid out idea and, 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 and visual of what it means to make a disciple. It begins with us. And it begins with, with the point when we say, I'm going to step out of the comfort zone and I'm going to go into the world as I've been sent because I know Christ has equipped me to do so. Christ has commissioned you. Christ is, is, is putting upon you his, his, uh, his seal of approval and is going to work through you as you're sent. Christ commissions you. Your faith community commissions you. That, that, that as your church, we say and encourage you and will seek to do all that we can to equip you to go and to make disciples. And so... When the, I love how this passage in Romans ends. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So I say to you, take your pretty feet and go. <laughs> go into the world as you are going, I should say, and make disciples. There's this word. I, uh, there's, there's, there's something incredible about the Greek language that has words that are, are full of meaning that perhaps our language doesn't quite have. The word paraclete means to one who walks alongside. It means one who's an advocate. There's, a, there's legal terminology in, inherently mixed up in this. Uh, but the visual is one who's walking alongside. And I can't help but think of a, of a paraclete, that I'm lacing up a paraclete and I'm, I'm getting ready to walk alongside. That, that this person is, is what we are called to be in a discipling relationship, that we would build relationship. In, in earlier Christianity, um, not so much in, in first century Christianity, but certainly um, after that point, there was a model that was seen to grow as to how evangelism went. Now, this is drawn from, from um, a book by Hunter, the, uh, the Celtic uh, Way of Evangelism, I believe it's called. Uh, I, I didn't record that, unfortunately. But the, there is a, a Roman model of doing evangelism that was necessary, and it had to be because of the persecution that the church was under. That, that not everyone was welcomed into a church service as we welcome people, where we'd go out and we'd run into somebody, and we'd say, hey, why don't you come with me to church? And they come, and they're a part of the things. 
The Roman model uh, is presentation, decision, then fellowship. That, that it was very person to person or, or, or very, uh, uh, very intimate in how the message of Christ was presented. And, and yet, it was not until the person had made a decision for Christ that they were welcomed into the fellowship of believers. Now, the Celtic model, which, which the book was about, posits that Christianity is more caught than taught. That in our world today, especially in the Western world, this is the truth. That, that it's, it is much more fruitful, it is more, much more easily caught than taught, seen and received rather than taught. The, the Celtic model is fellowship, that we build relationships with the world around us, whether they are believers or they're not, but we build relationships with them as, as Christ has changed our life, that we would love others, followed by ministry and conversation, that, that, that it's not predicated on this relationship that we have, you know and I know, I'm just trying to convert you. That we would love others simply because th they are made in the image of God. And that God has loved us so much that we might love others, whether or not they come to faith. But that we minister to, minister to them amidst that, have conversations with them. And when they say, you know what, I don't, I don't, this whole religion thing, I don't want to talk about that with you anymore. And we, and we don't go, well, fine then. I'm out of here. We say, that's fine. You know, and, and we continue to be friends with them. We continue to be believers in their life. That in the fact that we are willing to, to, despite what culture would say about believers, to still associate with them, to not treat them as the unwashed masses, but, by, but as people who are made in the image of God and beloved by God, as in very much the same way, if we are in a discipling relationship and someone makes a decision for Christ, we don't go, well, that checks the box. I'm out of your life now. That we would come into our relationships with others with the mindset of Christ. That, that Celtic model of, of fellowship, ministry, and conversation, and then thirdly, perhaps belief and invitation to commitment. That as somebody says, you know, I'm, 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 I've seen in you, I've heard from you, there is something about that, and I, I, I believe that this Christ that has made a change in you is my Savior. That, that he, he was raised from the grave, and we can offer an invitation to commit their life to Christ, that they would do so not all by their lonesome, but in, commu in, the, in the, the, the communion of fellow believers who have made that same commitment. A disciple who is discipling someone who is discipling somebody. I want you to consider the idea of that, that you are in a relationship with somebody who is committed in their faith, who is in a relationship with somebody who is growing in their faith. That three-tiered, that, that would make you a discipler. That, that you are participating in an expo exponential multiplying effect in making disciples. Really living into this this fact that a disciple knows and obeys Christ. We see that Christ poured into just a matter of a of, of few. There were those who were considered disciples because they were seeking as students the teaching of Jesus as their teacher. Yet he poured into 12, a small group, which is a model that the church uses and, and other groups and secular groups use extensively for discipleship. Within those 12, he poured into three all the more. J Peter, James, and John, and, and then John, the writer of our gospel today, all the more. The one that Jesus loved. And he was in a mentor relationship with John and, and was, in, was doing more instruction and teaching and, and, and having them bear witness to more of his ministry, Peter, James, and John. This is, this is the formula that we're seeking, and it's not in any self-help book, it's not in some new talking head that we see in, in, at a conference or something, it's in Scripture. 
that's from our Savior and our Lord Jesus. Ephesians 5.1, follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Even Christ points out that his command to us is that we would love others as he has loved us. When he asked what are what are the great when he's asked what are the greatest commandments, he's like, well, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, everything that you are, and love your neighbor as yourself. That is noble indeed, but to believers the call for us is to not only just love our neighbors, but to love others as Christ has loved us. How did Jesus love us? Well, he did so with a measure that is without limit. That greater love has this world never seen than when it is bearing witness to one who would give up their life for another. Jesus his destiny was the cross, and thereby bringing victory over death. Three days later, as he was resurrected, this is how Jesus loves us. This is how you are dearly loved, that Christ would come to this world from the resplendent glory of heaven to this life of brokenness and pain and sin, that our sins would be placed on him, and his death that he died would be ours. We look to Jesus in all that we do as believers. All the more should we look to Jesus as our example of love, that we would love with the same measure of Christ. So what does that look like? How, how do we bring in, how do we make disciples? We see that we're commissioned, and above all things, in all that we do, we see that we are called to love. And loving, as, as it relates to making disciples means I see your sins, I see your shortcomings, and I love you anyway for them. This is the Christ that we serve. This is the one that can come into our lives and transform it, for that is what we see time and time again in Scripture. Would you seek to have transformation in your life? Would you seek to receive unto yourself forgiveness and peace Beyond understanding, it is found in Christ. Would you commit today to seek to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ as his disciple, as his follower, as you, we submit ourselves, give our lives over to the one that gave us our life in the first place. Trust him as your Lord and Savior. Believe in him. Find the peace that this world cannot offer and begin the journey of of seeing Christ transform not only your life, but the lives of those that you care for and the lives that you meet as you become a disciple that knows and obeys, that brings others to become disciples who know and obey Christ, who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples. What a calling is given upon us in our life that above all things, we would love as Christ has loved us and gave up his life for us. To God be glory today. Amen.
go forth knowing that we are loved and called to a higher purpose. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.